100 verse 5 for the Lord is good his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations I like that very much his truth endureth to all generations turn that around and it tells you very clearly that error will not endure to all generations come on say amen one day error will end along with those who insist on living their lives by error and many of them are in the seventh-day adventist church one day error false doctrine will cease along with those who persist in living their lives by false teaching let me thank God publicly for the high honor he's given me to be with you today and if all goes well all this week I call it a high honor because angels would love to do what I'm about to do but it's given to sinners such as I and not to angels and so I am conscious of the fact that I am enjoying a privilege angels would love to exercise and the best I can do for God is to deliver plain and simple thus saith the Lord truth sanctifies when Jesus prayed to his father in John 17 he said sanctify them how through thy truth opinions do not sanctify truth sanctified because of this I will keep my treasured opinions to myself and I will give you thus said the Lord accompanied by some insight from his servant what's her name never forget that name you said it very weakly I'm sorry to see that what's her name uh, God bless you and doubly bless your children I want to thank the Sanhedrin of Emashaya for inviting me here to be a part of this week I really mean that brother Andal Higgins who pursued me for a while and finally caught me that's why persistence is good but the pleasure is mine and the privilege as well God loves you that amen was half starved God loves you now he really does whether you serve him or not God loves you that doesn't mean that you do whatever you like and he will love you into his kingdom he will destroy you lovingly so while he loves you he wants you to obey him my favorite word is obey so if you don't like the word obey still stay and it will grow on you during the week is there anyone present who is not a seventh-day Adventist may I see your hand you're not a seventh-day Adventist may I see your hand ah oh, please stand please as quickly as you possibly can good afternoon how are you what's your name crystal crystal andrews crystal who invited you hmm who that brother okay crystal as a church we love having guests am i right thank you for coming crystal may the lord bless you so much that you become a blessing to others say amen for crystal and Crystal, you must come again. If you agree to that, smile. There you are. All right, Crystal will come again. That young man, what's your name? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Make sure she comes back. I'll be looking for her. All right. Crystal, God bless you and your family. Hi. What's your name? You can drop the mask temporarily. The Lord will protect you. What's your name? Petronella. Hello, Petronella. How are you? Where are you from? Is that in Guyana? Okay. Well, it's nice to have you. Who invited you? A family invited you. God bless that family. Petronella, thank you very much for coming. May the Lord grant you the desires of your heart. Say amen for Petronella. Now, Petronella, before you sit, I want you to come back visit with us again you won't regret it say amen for our sister amen. 
Anybody else? Personally, you miss it. Anyone else? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. Raise your hand. If the person is shy, just do that. Where? Did I see your hand? Are you? Please stand. Or are you pointing at someone? Are you a, give, are you a visitor? What's your name? Sister Henry, how are you? Where are you from? Where? New Amsterdam. In Guyana. Okay. <laughs> Sister Henry, who invited you? Your grandson is a nice boy. Where is he? Brother grandson, where are you? Where? Oh, oh, hi. Thank you very much for bringing your lovely grandmother. God bless you. What's your name? Who? Timmy. Tinny? As tiny? Tinny, tiny. All right, Tinny. God bless you. Sister Henry, uh, it's nice of you to come. May the Lord bless your life, preserve you, place a hand of mercy upon you, and let that hand lead you right into his kingdom. Say amen. amen. You may be seated, my lovely sister. God bless you. My good brother, thank you very much for bringing anybody else. You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. Okay. Before I jump into the message, which is wanted, dead, or alive, I want you to be sure if you're not using one of these things that now popularly masquerade as Bibles, if you're not using it, please turn it off so it does not disturb us. But if you're using it, you don't need sound to read. Are you with me? And do not go to the internet in the house of God. All right. We must show God reverence. I said earlier, God loves you, but God is a serious God. When God told Moses, come up to the mount, Exodus 34, he said, no man shall come up with thee. Neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount. Neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. If anyone else had gone up to that mountain, that person, finish it for me, would have been killed. By whom? The loving God does not joke. So don't confuse the love of God with God being a tolerant God in the sense that he tolerates sin. He does not. The angels come before God with their faces veiled. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. This is not a joke. I mean that. Ask him to do that. He'll do it. Because God has promised this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, finish it for me, he heareth us. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth, and I want to speak God's words. Favor number three, think. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us do what? Re, which tells me that God is reasonable. The devil is not. God is reasonable. When Cain murdered his brother, God came down to talk to him. When Adam sinned, God came down. Let's discuss this. God is a reasoner. Say amen for God. I really like God. You know, we all say we love him, but I like God. I tell him all day, Father, you're a nice person. I like you. No, I do. All day long. I tell him that. Let's pray. Father, I come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. When I come in his name, I come in the name of the one who said, let there be light. I come in the name of the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. I come in the name of the one who said, I and my father are one. And I come in the name of the one who said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. In his name, dear God, I come before you. If I have sinned against you, Father, forgive me, dear God. Micah 7 verse 18 says that you delight in mercy and mercy is not more highly expressed than in forgiveness. Father, I commit my life to you. I recommit my life right now for the proclamation of this message. Please, God, 
use me as a musician uses an instrument father I offer no resistance tell me what to say when to say it and how to say it let me speak boldly but with compassion for I too am a sinner bless all those pleasant present but a special blessing on our three guests day God let their experience be such that they will come and worship with us again bless this country from the highest level of leadership their God remind them father in all the deliberations that righteousness exalteth a nation and that the most high ruleth in the kingdoms of men now father take full control I pray bless those online who will listen to this message in the name of Jesus Christ I pray let's God people say amen and amen what's our subject wanted dead or alive a few years ago there was a knock on my front door I answered two Mormons I invited them in and in the course of the conversation they told me that the Mormons are God's specially called people on the earth and I admired their boldness in saying that without any distinct biblical foundation sometime either before or prior to that or after that there was a knock on my door always a Sunday morning I opened the door three Jehovah's Witnesses invited them in because I am an evangelist I invited them in in the course of our discussion they told me there are God's special witnesses on the earth and they said it without blinking an eye as verily as the Mormons said it I grew up in the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church believes salvation is only possible through the sacraments of that church did you hear what I said the Catholic Church believes that salvation is only possible through the sacraments of that church what do Adventists say about our status on this earth in relation to God do we say we are God's special people or are we like anybody else go to Exodus 19 we'll read from verse 4 what's our subject wanted dead or alive Exodus 19 verse 4 I do not see a clock anywhere on any of these walls so I cannot track okay it's, I have 1230 am I close to being correct all right maybe 115 I'll be done what book did I say no there's no book called amen what book did I say <laughs> Exodus 90 chapter 19 let's read from verse 4 do you have that not yet I give you five more seconds Exodus 19 reading from verse 4 when you find it say amen God speaking to Moses said ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles wings and brought you unto myself now therefore if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant then don't go no pause then and only then if I may say that then he shall be unto me what a kingdom of priests and a holy nation now a peculiar people unto me above all people I shall say that are on the face of the earth and he shall be unto me verse 6 a kingdom of priests and a holy nation which means God wanted on this earth a people special to himself above everybody else but there was a condition if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant keep the word covenant in mind and go to Exodus 34 we read 27 verse 3 28 of Exodus 34 our subject wanted dead or alive Exodus 34 reading verse 28 do you have that not yet do you have it now and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights he denied to do what eat bread nor drink water and he wrote upon the tables what 
the words of the come on finish it the ten commandments the foundation of god's covenant are the ten commandments because salvation has a condition that condition is come on obedience let me say it again salvation has a condition that condition is obedience and so god called a people on this earth and he gave them what he wanted them to obey that is his law now go to romans chapter 2 we'll read uh, 23 and 24 of romans 2 wanted dead or alive romans 2 23 and 24 Thou that makest thy boast of the law, verse 23, through breaking the law, finish that verse, dishonor, and now Paul is saying, do you not understand that by breaking the law, what do you do? You dishonor God. Think with me, think with me. Disobeying the law of God, it has consequences for us, yes. Because the wages of sin is death. But the consequence for us is not the most important consideration. The most important consideration is what it does to God. Too many of us live our lives by what we want. Not considering what God wants. And so thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. Obedience to the law therefore honors God. Disobedience dishonors God. Now read verse 24. If you have the King James Version, read it for me. What does that say? For the name of God, come on, is blaspheme among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. Pause. Listen carefully to me. Obeying God first benefits God. Go to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. You all know it. You shouldn't have to go to it. But go to it. It's okay. Do you have Psalm 23, the shepherd psalm? I hope you have the right version for saying this one. If you have it, say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Pause. Take a deep breath. Read the next statement. Ah. What are the paths of righteousness? What is the whole duty of man? Keep his commandments. What are the paths of righteousness? The commandments of God. Now listen again. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness or he empowers me to do what? He empowers me to do what? Come on, four letters. He empowers me to do what? Obey. Why? Finish the verse. For his name, let me say it clearly, obeying God's law is first for God's glory. Why is that? Let us go to Colossians 1. Now I am preaching to an Adventist congregation, not a Baptist congregation, or a holiness congregation, or Pentecostal congregation, God bless all of them. I am preaching to a Seventh-day Adventist congregation. There ought to be things you hear from an Adventist pulpit that you hear nowhere else. Colossians 1. Let's read verse 20. Before I read, let me pray again. Father in heaven, restrain me, remind me my presence in this pulpit is for your glory, not mine. Speak through me, dear God, and choke my carnal nature into submission. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 20, Colossians 1, read with me carefully. And having made peace, come on, through the blood of his cross, read carefully, to reconcile what? All things by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be in earth or... Wait a minute. 
What is reconciliation? Bringing two opposing parties together. Are you listening to me? The Bible says the cross of Christ worked reconciliation, things on earth, come on, and things in heaven. Why was there a need for reconciliation between God and things in heaven, meaning angels? Listen to me carefully. When Satan rebelled, some angels left with him. Revelation 12 verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. Finish the verse. And his angels were cast out, some left. But some who remained still had, come on, read my mind, questions about God and how he treated, come on, Lucifer. You see why you ought to pray for me? This is heavy. Well, not heavy, but strange. Listen to me carefully. There were angels in heaven that still had questions about the fairness of God in his treatment of Lucifer. They had to be reconciled. So that salvation is much more about saving this little earth that Ellen White calls an atom of a world. The world is a grain of sand in the universe. The focus of salvation is not simply reconciling the world, but the universe to God. Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1149, paragraph 10. Listen to these words, but tell me what I just said. Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1149, paragraph 10. The angels were horror-stricken that one who had been of their number could fall so far as to be capable of such cruelty, meaning what they did to Christ on Calvary. When the angels in heaven saw what Satan and his demons did to Christ, Ellen White said they were horror-stricken. Every sentiment of sympathy and pity which they had ever felt for Satan in his exile was quenched in their hearts. What does she mean by that? It was only at the cross that some angels in heaven finally realized that Satan was absolutely no good and God was right. For thousands of years, God was under suspicion by holy angels. In that same chapter, that same paragraph, she goes on to say, it caused the angels to shudder with horror and severed forever the last tie of sympathy existing between Satan and the heavenly world. Let me say it again. There were angels for thousands of years viewed God with suspicion. Now, that's not sin, but they still needed reconciliation to God. Now, we have not only angels, we have unfallen worlds. Is anybody with me? We have unfallen worlds. There are planets where other people live who've never sinned, but they're subject to the same questions. That has to be made straight. Because Satan's charge, you know, when Satan went up to heaven in Job chapter 1, chapter 2, he would go constantly up to heaven as the representative of the earth. But when Christ died, that stopped. Because the death of Christ made him the legal possessor of this earth. And so Satan could not go back anymore because the second Adam bought back what the first Adam lost. Are you with me? All right. Now, this controversy is not ended. You see, Seventh-day Adventists, we have an umbrella under which we study every Bible topic. That umbrella is what? The great controversy between Christ and Satan. Christ uses us to defend his cause. The devil uses people to defend, I almost said us, people to defend his cause. Are you clear? Let me say it again. There is a controversy between Christ and Satan. Every single event on the earth 
is connected to that controversy. Every choice I make that disgraces God supports Satan's claim. Every choice I make that glorifies God undermines Satan. So it's not what I want. It is what is best for God or what is best for Satan. Now, Satan knows that. So he wants you. Here's what the Bible says. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. What's our subject? Wanted dead or alive. 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's read verse 8. It's a well-known verse. You know it very well. Do you have that? Some of you still looking. Adventists used to be called the people of the book, but we are not called that anymore, and that's so sad. Maybe we can get back there. What do you say? Read with me. Be sober. Come on. Be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Let's look at the word seeking. Satan actively seeks people to destroy them. And for those of you who think I will worship from home online, even though the church is open, you're making a mistake. Isolation is the devil's weapon. He gets you isolated. You are on the path to trouble. There's a reason God called people together. The Sabbath is to be a holy convocation. That's a coming together. I pass no judgment. I'm simply trying to open eyes. You, if the church is open, you can't stay lying on your couch dressed as if you just came out of the oven and you're worshiping God. Come to church and worship with God's people. The devil seeketh such. He's an active adversary now. Keep the word seeking in mind and go with me to Luke chapter 19. Jesus is talking to Zacchaeus, that publican, short fellow. Ran up into a tree to see Jesus, sycamore tree. We're in Luke 19. Listen to what Jesus told Zacchaeus in verse 10. Read with me. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, what do we have? Who is seeking in 1 Peter 5 verse 8? The devil is seeking you. This is not your. The devil, Satan suffers from insomnia, you see. He doesn't sleep. He can't afford to because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. God has to bring this thing to an end, so God is also in a hurry. Satan is seeking. God is seeking. What are they seeking? Go to John chapter 10. What's our subject? Now keep this in mind as you read John 10 verse 10. Wanted dead or alive. Are you there? The thief cometh not. Read with me. Come on. But for to steal, come on, to kill and to destroy. Do you see the word kill? Destroy? Who is the thief? Satan. Now, finish the verse. I am come. Come on. That they might have livestock. Jesus came to see. The thief comes to see. They, they seek what they want. The devil wants you to kill you. Jesus wants you to save you. You are wanted, come on, dead or alive. Now, whether you end up dead or alive is up to you. It's up to you. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, says God, come on, choose life. That both thou and thy seed may live, choose life. Let's look at the devil recruiting people to his cause. Let's go to our scripture reading. Where did it come from? Genesis 3, we read, let's go to Genesis 2. I have 13 minutes to one. I'm in good shape. Genesis 2, we read 16 and 17, our subject, wanted, dead, or alive. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. 
For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God does not hide consequences. God does not jump from behind the bush and ambush you. God comes up front. Can you say amen? Yes. By the way, don't ambush one another with gossip. Come on, be up front. Somebody say amen. Yes. Too much backstabbing in the church of God. If your brother have done aught against you, go and tell him his fault between him and you alone. Don't go on social media. You offend God. For in the day thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt, that's what God said. God wants to spare them death. He tells them the consequences. Let's go to chapter 3. We'll read from verse 1. Our subject, wanted, dead or alive. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. <clears throat> and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God, verse 5, doth know that in the day ye eat thereof. Stop. What did God tell them not to do? Don't eat. So when the devil says, in the day ye eat, what is he saying? In the day ye dis Who said disobey? Oh, I like that person. God bless you. In the day ye disobey. But give me a smaller word for disobey. In the day ye sin, then your eyes, come on, shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, listen to verse 6, and try to prevent yourself from crying. But focus on me. You've already seen what a woman looks like. Focus on me. Oh, well, on the word, I should say. Read verse 6 for me. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, mm -hmm, come on, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Keep going. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Stop. Listen to the sad, sad words. Oh, bring it close. Don't worry. Bring it close. I... Oh, thank you. It can't be too close. Mm -hmm. I don't feel anything, but bring it close. <laughs> Let's read verse 6 again. You read it for me. What does it say? Ah, that's nice. That's nice. God bless you. Come on, read verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was... Stop. Something happened between verses 2 and 3 and verse 6. In 2 and 3, she told the devil... God told us, don't eat of it. She added, don't touch it, lest you die. She told the serpent that. In the course of her exchange, we do not know how long it ran. Her thinking, come on, changed. What led to death, she now sees as leading to life. This tactic from Satan has not changed. When you listen to any voice except the voice of God, you will inevitably conclude that sin is a blessing. That disobedience has advantages and benefits. You will look at a worldly lifestyle and you will say, and it will be said of you, and when she saw that that lifestyle was pleasing to God, which it is not. And when he saw that that style of speaking was pleasing to God, which it is not. And when they saw that this peculiar diet that depopulates the animal population was pleasing to God, which it is not. And when she saw that this romantic behavior was pleasing to God, which it is not. And when he or she saw that hairstyle was pleasing to God, which it is not. And so we have a church that cannot differentiate between worldly and spiritual. This is a youth weekend, but you all look young. You know, the gospel does not have an age limit. Nor does hell. Hell. 
nor does heaven. All ages of sinners <clears throat> go that way. All ages of believers go that way. The wages of sin is death applies to whomever sins. The gift of God is eternal life applies to whomever obeys God by the power of Christ. The devil wants you that you might help him fortify his charge against God, which is God's law cannot be kept. People serve God out of fear. When God told him, look at Job, what did the devil say? Doth Job fear God for not? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth now thy hand and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee. He is serving you for what he gets out of you. We serve God out of love. The devil charged God with buying. Job cannot keep your law. He has to buy your love and your favors. When you and I obey God, God turns to the devil, sticks a divine finger in his face. and say, you see that young lady? There's proof my law can be kept. Come on, somebody say amen. You see that young man? There's proof someone can love me even if it means loss of life. But when you and I disobey God, the devil sticks his bony finger in God's face. You see him? I told you, your law cannot be kept. You see her with everything falling out of her dress? I told you, the law can't be kept. Now, you and I have to decide, will I cause Satan to use me to embarrass God? Or will I allow God to use me to embarrass Satan? My listening friend, young or old or in between, you are not on this earth for yourself. A few years ago, I was in South Africa, a beautiful country. I was in a restaurant with a young man. He took me for lunch. And he and I sat in the booth, and the waitress came over. She had a piece of metal somewhere either in her lip or somewhere a piece of metal. So I said, may I ask her a question? She said, sure. I said, why did you put that thing? She said, because I want to. Let me tell you something. Because I want to is the reason most people do what they do. Because I want to. But this goes contrary to what the Bible tells the Christian. Whether therefore ye eat, come on, or drink, come on. Come on, give me some more examples. Whether therefore ye eat, or drink, or work, or engage in a romantic relationship, or go to college, or plan a diet. Finish the verse. Do all to the glory of God. If it doesn't glorify God, it glorifies Satan. You said true, true because you're nice people, but did you follow me? If it does not glorify God, it glorifies Satan. So Jesus says, he that is not with me, come on, is against me. And so there are a lot of church members against God. But in church... Wearing the uniform of heaven, but doing the devil's work. In a war, that brings the death penalty immediately. If Guyana fights Suriname, are you with me? The Guyanese army, the Surinamese army, and a Guyanese soldier puts on a Suriname uniform to, dis to deceive them. If he's caught, he must be shot by the Suriname army immediately. You cannot fight a battle wearing the enemy's uniform. That's a law of warfare. But many of us, we wear the uniform of God and we do the work of the devil. And God in his mercy does not kill us. He sends the spirit. He sends a week like this. To reach people. When Christ was in a judgment hall and Pilate brought him to the spectators, Pilate said, Here's Christ, I find no fault in him. Here's Barabbas, a convicted criminal. Whom do you want? 
those church members wearing long robes and having gone through all the rituals to stay clean, they said, give us, come on, Barabbas. Doing the devil's work, wearing the uniform of God. Young man, young woman, God has called you to represent him. But as a Seventh-day Adventist, God has called you from the world and from all other churches. Now, God loves everyone. Don't misunderstand me. But whom did he call out of Egypt? Why are you taking so long? Whom did he call out of Egypt? Did he call the Egyptians? No. But some came, and God said, fine. Listen to me. God called the Israelites. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then it shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. An obedient person is closer to Christ than anybody else. Now, you may say, wait a minute, this is, this is not biblical. How many disciples did Jesus have? Let me pray again. Father, as I continue, remember, Father, at all times, remind me I am here for your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. He had 12. Were there three that frequently went with him where the other nine couldn't go? Come on, talk to me. Yes. You know why? He was closer to those three. When he went to the Gethsemane to suffer, he took Peter, James, and John. He left the other eight. Judas had already gone. When he healed Jairus' daughter, he only took Peter, James, and John. When he went to the Mount of Transfiguration, he took Peter, James, and John. Left frequently, he left the other, not because he didn't love them, but there are degrees of closeness to God. Are you listening to me? But of the three, <laughs> hmm? At the Last Supper, who was leaning on his breast? Come on, talk to me. John. John was so close. Peter said, ask him who will betray him. Don't let anyone ask God anything for you. Come on, ask him yourself. Get so close to God, ask him yourself. I told you earlier, Exodus 34. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. You can go there with me. And I will write upon these tables the words that I wrote upon the first tables which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. Verse 3, you have it? Read with me. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount. Neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. Only you. Not even Joshua. Not even Aaron. Moses had an access to God. No one else had. Now, no one can prevent you from being as close to Christ as John was. It's your choice. But our subject, which is wanted, dead, or alive. I want you to make a choice today. Lord, here is my life. Work through me to support and defend your character. Let nothing I do, let nothing I eat, let nothing I wear, let no behavior of mine support Satan. You're as quiet as a graveyard. Did I say something wrong? Let me repeat at the risk of irritating you. Let nothing I wear, let nothing I eat, let no behavior of mine make me a defender of Satan and an opponent of God. Because I am wanted, come on, dead or alive. Satan wants me dead. God wants me alive. But we know from Genesis 3, the devil presented sin beautifully. If you sin, if you disobey, you'll be like God. Take these drugs. 
you'll be the life of the party. Get drunk every weekend. Uh, your friends will think you're intelligent. Do whatever. Do this. Do that. Satan makes sin attractive. Many years ago, there was a movement in Canada to sell cigarettes in black and white boxes. <laughs> that went absolutely nowhere. Because black and white boxes are not attractive. No one would buy the cigarettes. And so the industry resisted that and continued to use beautifully decorated boxes. Because they give the impression of something lovely on the inside. I often say when I preach, because I fly so much, there are these uh, little brochures in the seat pocket in ahead of you, and they advertise things, particularly on long flights like Detroit to Johannesburg or something, and you see all the alcohol you can buy on the plane. Beautiful bottles designed by some artist, but what's in there? Cirrhosis of the liver. <laughs> Cigarettes, what's in there? Cancer of the lung. That's the way the devil functions. God comes as he is. But it's one of the reasons and the most overpowering reason. Yes, the devil wants to kill you. God wants to save you. But let me go one step further with God wants to save you. God wants to save you by himself instead of letting you be killed. Ah, you're not with me. You're hungry. You're not with me. Instead of letting you be killed, huh? God said, I'll die for you. I will die. When I say I will die, listen to me very carefully. Jesus was crucified. He wasn't killed. This side always says, all right. And that side looks at me as though I need medication. Let me say it again. Jesus was crucified. He was not killed. I don't mean to be sensational, but think. Go to John 10. You'll understand what I mean. John chapter 10, quickly. Who has it? You're too slow. You're Guyanese. You're supposed to be quicker than this. John 10, reading from verse 16. Do you have it? No, you don't. Uh, you have it now? Read with me. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father what? Love me. Why? Ah, let's read carefully, read microscopically, because I do what? I lay down my life that I might take it again. Notice, I lay down my life. Go to verse 18. Come on, what does it say? No man taketh it from me. Stop. Say that differently. No man taketh it from me. Say it differently. No man kills me. Finish the verse now. I lay it down of myself. It's essential to understand that, to grasp the depth of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Christ didn't die for us because he was hit by a car. He voluntarily gave up his life. Voluntarily. And by the way, the same person who laid down his life came back from the dead. Can you say amen? amen? You've got a God who gave up everything for you and came back to make available to you everything he has. Let me say it slowly. Jesus Christ, who is seeking you, he wants you alive. He died in your place. The devil wants you to die in his place. I don't want to tell you too much in one sermon, but I'll try this on you. Every person who is saved, someone has to suffer for that person's sins. In burn in the flames of hell. Are you listening to me? Someone, because the law says the law is broken, someone has to pay. Everyone who is saved Someone has to suffer in the flames of hell. You know who that is? Satan. Everyone who is lost, that person suffers for himself or herself, not Satan. 
Which means, follow me closely, the more he gets on his side, finish my words, the less he suffers. How can you commit your life to easing Satan's suffering? Recommit your life to God. Now, when I say recommit your life, I mean all aspects of your life. Talking to the young people particularly. You know, when you're young, I used to be young, I forgot when that was. A young man says, here am I, I have, have appeared on the stage of action, here am I, or a young woman. Oh, don't tell me anything, I can handle this. I can deal with this, don't tell me anything, but keep an eye on me, but don't tell me anything. I, I've got this, as they say. That's the way the youth are. This looks interesting, let me jump off this cliff, see what happens. That's the youth. God wants to use that for his glory. Are you following me? You want to jump off a cliff? Go do some evangelism in North Korea. Are you following me? He wants to use that. Now, but your commitment to him must be 100%. Listen to me carefully. If you commit your life to God, 99%. You tell me, mathematicians all, who controls the 1%? Satan, listen to me again. I'm closing. In order to save you, God needs how much of you? All. all. Let me say that again. This is essential. In order to save me, God needs all of me. But in order to destroy me, Satan only needs a little piece. And that little piece may be fashion that I will not surrender to God. That little piece may be my romantic life. That little piece may be how I spend my money. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. All. Listen to me carefully. Unless the surrender is all, you cannot experience justification by faith, which is salvation, the new birth. It must be all. Is there an area of your life that's not surrendered to God? You answer that in the privacy of your own heart. But if there is, bring that under the control of God. You see, God and Satan have two outcomes. For Satan, your joy will turn to sorrow. For God, your present sorrow, come on, will turn to joy. How long will that joy last? Forever. Now, you tell me, intelligent as you are, what choice should you make? My sorrow will turn to joy forever. Wanted? Come on. Dead or alive? Who wants you dead? Who wants you alive? What's your choice? Let me ask you again. There was some hesitation. Who wants you dead? Who wants you alive? What's your choice? If God is your choice, stand with me. Now listen carefully. Listen carefully. I'm about to make a call and I want you to come. If it applies to you. There is an area of your life you know it is not fully surrendered to God. Plain and straight. If that applies to you and you want to bring that to God now, come. There is an area of your life, regardless of your age, not under the control of God. If that's the case, come and give it to him right now. Most people who are lost will be very decent law-abiding people who never got a traffic ticket, never cheated on their taxes, but some area of their lives was not under the control of God. 
the Bible says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. My call is, if there is one area in your life, it may be a romantic relationship you should not be in. You have to choose, shall I hurt God or hurt this person? You make the choice. It may be, I think my bills are so intimidating I cannot return a tithe. Mistake. It may be, I have to work occasionally on Sabbath, the bank requires it, and I have a mortgage. Mistake. Don't get a house and get hell too. Because both you and the house will burn. I'm not scaring you, but the most popular verse in the Bible has positive and negative. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. The verse has life and perish. The choice is yours. God is watching us as we make this commitment to him and I join you in this commitment. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Our Father in heaven, if I said anything I should not have said, forgive me. If I did not listen to your spirit when he said, don't say this or say that, forgive me, dear God. If I was too harsh with your people, forgive me. Help me to do better next time. But Father, you know I tried. Truth is not popular. Church attendance is popular, truth is not. Now God, as your people assemble in your presence to make this commitment, they have come to say, there is an area in my life that I know is not under the control of Christ. As long as that remains the case, Father, that soul is in danger. But we've come to make a total surrender, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, dear God, accept this surrender let us repeat it every single day because the devil will try to take us back because he does not want to lose anyone father open our eyes dear god let us not fall into the condition of our first mother eve who after parleying with the devil saw a forbidden tree as good for food let us distance ourselves from the enemy, from the things of this world, because extended exposure will change our thinking. Let us go to the word of God, which is clear. That will transform us. Dear Father, if there's someone under the sound of my voice rustling with this, determined, this, uh, this dedication, this commitment, let the Spirit work extra energetically, Father, to bring him or her to the point of total surrender to God. That's what you want. Because when you gave Christ, it was a total gift. Now, Father, as I, give the, as I close this prayer, then we go back to our seats to sing the closing song. Let us go back with the determination that I will...